All right, yeah, good morning, welcome. Uh, it's June 8th already. We're on week three now. Um, yeah, test Friday. Hope the uh, video lecture yesterday wasn't, or was fine, I suppose. Um, on the topic of the yesterday's being recorded, uh, things are pretty chaotic for me right now, and I'm going to need um, the next couple days, I'm going to need that time during the day to handle, um, to handle some stuff. Uh, my PhD research, as well as um, some moving stuff. So I'm going to record both of those lectures tonight, for tomorrow and for Thursday, and um, hopefully I'll be able to just upload them They'll probably upload overnight, so then um, you'll have access to both of them tomorrow. Um, I will still be available for questions or anything. If you have any questions, text me, message me um, on whatever platform you prefer. I just can't dedicate, you know, three hours during the day. Um, but I'll be able to answer questions here and there. Are we going to have access to the uh, the test of la or our last test so I can see what I got wrong and all that? Yes, actually. Somebody messaged me before uh, class today, before lecture today, and I did. Um, my fear with opening it up, right, is that there's going to be some people. I don't know if there's anybody in this class who would do it, but there are going to be people who would want to, like, grab these questions and upload them to Chegg or whatever. Um, so that's kind of my fear with that. But... I did open it up, so you should be able to go back to, uh, at least to that module and that exam link. If you click on that and go back to the exam, it should show you all of the questions that you had and the answers and what you answered. So yeah, you can go oh, back okay. and use did that Did you just study. do that today? I checked last night. I was, I didn't, was that today that you did it? I did it this morning, yeah. Okay, good. All right, cool. I'll go back in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was... um. Something I've been, been planning to do but kept forgetting about. Um, and it's not very clear on the Canvas teacher side how it all works. But fortunately, the person who messaged me this morning was able to say, like, okay, they, they can get in and look at it. So it's confirmed, at least for one person, that it works. Okay, if you have problems, deal. let me know. Cool. Um, that being said, too, I did want to go over some of these, um, the ones that people really had seemed to have problems with that I saw that got missed a lot. Um, so how, do I, how did I want to do this? I think I'm just going to share my screen here and we're going to see if we can. Okay. How clear is that for you? Not at all. I can't even read anything. It's super blurry. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, you know what? I can do this. Let me Let me set this up real quick. It'll be better if I, um, okay. You can go to Canvas on my iPad. That should be nice and clear. Um, yeah, so I did, I did want to go over these and at least talk about them, if not work through them completely. Um, When I went back and looked at the test later, I was like, oh, a lot of these are tricky. Um, I felt like a lot of it was intentionally tricky, and I was like, gosh darn it. Like, <laughs> there were some that were just like, so I was like, oh my goodness, it could be two of these things. Or, ah, yeah. It was... Yeah, I, again, I'm still, you know, working out how to write questions. Uh, I do use, you know, other teachers' resources that I have available to me. Uh, but they like to write tricky questions. So, yeah, I'm trying to write less tricky questions, um, but still be able to target specific ideas with those questions. Um, we'll, I mean, we'll take a look at them right now. So, And hopefully I can kind of explain what I was looking for and trying to test on these. Okay. Let's see if I've got any embarrassing tabs open here. There's one about Wesley Crusher and cactuses. All right, that's fine. 
Uh, all right, Streamlabs. There we go. That's better. <clears throat> I can't write on this, but we're, we'll just kind of talk about this. Um, right, so these questions are not going to be in the order that you had them, right? And the answers are not going to be in the order that you had them because the order of questions that you get and the order of... Um, What's it called? The order of the responses is all randomized. Um, and there are, some of these questions do have multiple versions, um, which is to help with people sharing their answers, which is part of why I don't share the results of the test, right? So you don't know if you did well on the test, and you don't know if you got them right, so that if you did want to go over to your buddy, and be like, hey, the answer for this question is this, and you know. Um, this first one, you know, we, we did talk, we talked about uh, precipitation reactions, right? So you should look at this and see um, potassium nitrate, lead acetate, should be checking to see if it's a precipitation reaction. Um, and then seeing that, you know, potassium and acetate, as well as nitrate and lead don't form any solids. So that was no reaction. Um, a reaction which forms a solid product, right, is an example of a precipitation reaction, right? Precipitation forms solids when you mix two liquids. Um, this question I, oh, wait, you can't see that. I'm on my computer here. This question I threw out because I realized later it was a bad question, um, so everybody got points for this one. But a reaction which forms a gas product is an example of what I was looking for was a gas evolution reaction, but I realized I put combustion reaction in there, which also forms a gas product. Um, right, so I threw that one out. These ones were fairly simple. Like, name the symbol, right? I gave you a random symbol, um, and you just had to pick the correct name. I think almost everybody got those. Um, converting grams to atoms. I have seen people have a lot of trouble with this. Um, so these are some of the... Well... Let's say that we've got, just to do one of these really quick. Today's lecture is not too crazy long. Um, all right. Let's just say we have magnesium metal, right? So we have, I don't know, six grams. Okay. Yeah, my research advisor is calling. Let me text him here real quick. Okay. <clears throat> Let's say we've got six, we'll just say 6.00 grams of magnesium metal. Okay. And we want to know how many atoms of magnesium we have. So the first step for a question like this is to convert it from grams to moles, right? So you look up, and um, I believe these questions were compounds, um, but then you just find the molecular mass or molecular weight. And for magnesium, that's 24.31 grams of magnesium per one mole of magnesium. And I think what people are missing here is that when we talk about moles of magnesium, this is actually moles of magnesium atoms. And we, very, we almost always just leave that off because when we're talking about moles of something, we're talking about a number of atoms of something. Um, but I think maybe I wasn't clear enough in explaining that. So if we set this up, we'll see that we get 6.00 grams of magnesium. And we'll see, too, that the way I have this set up right now, magnesium, grams of magnesium is on top with grams of magnesium. So if we were to multiply these together, and I've seen a lot of people do this, the units that you end up with here are grams of magnesium times grams of magnesium. And so you get grams squared of magnesium, and then per mole, uh, 
which is a unit that doesn't make any sense. So instead what we need to do is flip this conversion factor, right? Because we can take these conversion factors and we can invert them. And now what we get is that we get grams of magnesium canceling. So we get, oh, we're not going to get 6.00, oh, but we're going to get 6 divided by 24.31, which is going to be 0 0.247 moles of magnesium atoms. And what I'm really looking for as like the final step here, I guess I shouldn't do that then. What I'm really looking for then is for you to take this and convert it into just atoms. So we have 0 0.247 moles magnesium atoms. We can eliminate moles as a unit by saying 6.022 times, oh, I did this backwards, 6.022 times 10 to the 23 individual atoms is equivalent to one mole of atoms. And so then we'll multiply that 0.247 times 6.022 e to the 23 and get 1 1.49 times 10 to the 23 atoms uh, atoms we should say of magnesium and so when you're doing these these converting to a number of atoms you're always going to have a really big number because you're always, you should always be multiplying by 10 to the you know 6.022 times 10 to the 23 so that's kind of a check that you can do that if you've done the math right, you're going to get a very, very large number. Okay. Let's swap back over to the test. <clears throat> um, right. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to go, I'm going to try and go for most of these. I want to go pretty quickly for some of them, right? They were, they were problem questions. Uh, grams to atoms is one, especially on um, the mole lab, which I finally got to grading this weekend. Um, a lot of people struggled with that. Converting uh, cals to joules, everybody did did well on those. Um, compound oxidation states. Okay, and this is something again. I don't know if if maybe I wasn't clear enough on this. Um, let's say we have something like H two O, right? We have water. Um, when we look at our priorities, right, it's F, H, O, right, F is minus one, oxidation is plus one, or hydrogen is plus one, oxygen is minus two. When we're talking about oxidation states, we're talking about the oxidation states of the individual atoms. So on these questions, I was asking things like, for this one, you know, what is the oxidation state of hydrogen? So you should look at this and see, oh, we have hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen takes priority over oxygen in terms of oxidation state. So then hydrogen is going to be a plus one oxidation state. And maybe I should have put in there per atom, um, but that's how oxidation states work. Uh, the other one that I threw in there, and again, so this question is a little bit tricky but it's to test the specific concept. I think I had one in there that was, I um, can't remember if I wrote it, F2O or O, I think it was OF2, right? Because oxygen is to the left of fluorine, so it's a little bit more metallic. Anyways, that wasn't the point of that question. The point of this question was that fluorine is higher on this priority list for oxidation states than oxygen is, right? So each fluorine atom has a minus one oxidation state. And we have to balance our oxidation states so that they equal zero. So then oxygen in this situation is plus two because it has to match the 
uh, 2 times minus 1 of fluorine. So it was the individual ones. The other one that uh, got a lot of people was this one, manganese oxide. So here, right, each oxygen is a minus 2. So combined, they're minus 6. And that has to equal then, or, you know, has to be the opposite of whatever it is on manganese. So manganese is plus 6 to balance those out. I want to move pretty quickly, but if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Okay, moving on. This one I thought was, I think almost everybody got this one. Um, you might have been able to guess it just because orange spray cranberry juice is a little bit of a meme at the moment, but I just wanted to replace Gatorade, right, with something else similar um, to give you a similar question to the one before, but not exactly the same. Um, can we get rid of the periodic table so we can see more of the... Oh, display? sorry. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> right, so this one's Ocean Spray Cranberry Juice. Um, I think everybody got this one, right? Flammability is a chemical property. Smell, physical state, and color are all uh, physical properties. Of course, the weed whacker's outside my window now. They just waited until class had started. Um, I think everybody got naming ion or matching the formula for the ionic compound. Um, yeah, temperature was fine. This one, and I think uh, I didn't specifically say that the rows of the periodic table are called periods. Right, so if we look at the periodic table, row four, at least on the one in the book, right, it does say period. So in period four is the fourth row. Um, bromine is the only one of these elements that's in this row. Um, oh, significant figures. Again, this was... Right, it's a trick question, but it's testing a specific... Well, it's not a trick question. It's a tricky question because it's testing a specific uh, concept, right? If you're given a 1,000, what are the significant figures? If there's no decimal place, it's ambiguous. I think I spelled that right. So that, that did get some people. Um, I did also have... You know, in my book, it says yeah. that that is for significant configures, and so it's ambiguous if there's a comma. Like, the, the exact example, it's like a 1,000 is four significant figures, and then on a 100,000 with a comma in there, it says that's ambiguous. So the that's, the that's, what, that. that's why, like, I, I probably got that one wrong. I'm trying to scroll through and find that question on here, but... I almost yeah. said ambiguous just because I remember talking about that, but then I, I referenced the book real quick, and it, that's what it said in the book. Okay. I mean, in class, I said if it, if it has trailing zeros and doesn't have a decimal place, it's ambiguous. So that is, yeah, a difference between what I said and what the book said. Um, we'll see. That would be a measurement and problem solving probably. Because even if you had 10, 10 would be ambiguous. It's all good. You on. No worries. Okay. I know you're trying to burn through this, so yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, we got to get to the... Okay. Yeah, I am, I'm sorry that the book... Um, in my opinion, the book there is wrong. Um, hey, sorry. My cat's trying to climb under my computer monitor. Uh, this was a basically a direct question pulled from the previous test. It was just, um, oh, and if if you see a question that's like this, that you're like, oh, that question is from the previous test. Um, I think some people just referenced their notes from the first test and wrote down whatever number they had. So these questions where I have um, 
an answer box like this, where you have to type in your answer, those are formulaic questions. So everybody gets different numbers on those. And you even got different numbers between the first test and this one. So don't try that, because you're just going to miss the question. And if you did it right the first time, you can do it this time. Um, but this one was just, you know, you're taking the, the mass of each, multiplying it by its percent abundance as a proportion. And actually, that was something that people missed. Um, swap back over here. This lecture, today's lecture is not too long. It's mostly conceptual, again, so not a lot of, um, not like, uh, not like redux. <clears throat> okay, so, right, if we have 97.8%, when you convert this to use it as a part of your math, because you can't use 97.8%, um, 97.8% should be used as 0.978% which is a proportion. Um, if you use this, then you need to divide by 100 at some point. Um, otherwise, you'll be off by a factor of 100. And that did get some people um, on one of the questions, particularly that one about iron. So just remember, you have to be using this is what you want to use when you're using percents. You got to divide that percent by 100 first to use it as a proportion. Um, this one was just balancing, right? Barium reacting with um, hydrogen, or with water to form barium hydroxide and hydrogen gas. Um, this one I was cursing because you had the same exact thing. It was H2 and then down a little bit, it says 2H, so I, yeah. I was clicking between the two. So the, the, key, the key on this one would be hydrogen gas. And hydrogen yeah. is one of the diatomics, which we'll get to today, why it's a diatomic. Um, the key for this one, I think, was, yeah, knowing that hydrogen is a hydrogen gas, um, or hydrogen is a diatomic, and that you need to balance the charge between the hydroxide and the barium. And since barium is a group two uh, alkaline earth metal, it has a two plus charge. And so it needs two hydroxides to balance that charge. Um, this one was messed up for some people at the beginning. Um, those people who took it early and got uh, my poorly written questions got the benefit of the doubt. So if you want to be one of the first people to take the test, I didn't take the test myself this time, and that's on me. So those people who did take it early, the first four people who took it, uh, got the benefit of the doubt on these. Um, on both of those, or which one are you talking about? Oh, sorry, on 20 here. Uh, I know 20 was definitely messed up. No, I think I, I think that 21 was fine. But in any of those problems that were... Um, yeah. Okay. Any of those ones that had problems, you, def you got the benefit of the doubt on those. I went through and looked at every single test individually and made sure that those answers lined up. What was the answer to 20? It was, um, well, really, okay, yeah, so let's, we can do, we can do this one, All right? So it's O2, 2CA to 2CAO. Was everyone's numbers different, like the amount of moles of oxygen they were doing? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, I was like, I really for a second. It's not the 20 I have. Right. If you go, if you go and look at it, your test, it will show you the answer, the question that you were given. Um, fortunately, the Canvas Quizzes puts in a number here for me so I can do an example for you. Um, I guess we don't really need to go over this one. So this one was just moles to moles, right? So I said this in class, but if you're, if you're comparing two atoms or molecules or anything in a reaction, you have to compare them moles to moles. Um, so the key here is, right, we have 4.05 moles of oxygen gas, which reacts with excess calcium, and you're given the balanced equation. Um, and you can see here that for every mole of oxygen gas, you get two moles of calcium oxide. So actually all you had to do for this one was double the number of moles of oxygen. And that was the correct answer. I, yeah, there were a lot of people who just put two or four. Um, 
but yeah, you had to double it. Um, this one, I think there was a question in the homeworks. You guys probably know better than I do. Um, so 350.1 grams. I'll just work this one out real quick. All right, so 350.1 grams of iron is what we want. And we know that we have, oh shoot, what was it? 60.9% by mass. And again, right, we need to take this 60.9% and convert it to 0 0.609. And so we got to know a little bit about how uh, percentages work here to make this work. But this is 0 0.609 iron to every one ore, really. You can call this grams or grams. And then you just divide 350 by 0 0.609. All right, 350.1 divided by 0 0.609. Uh, 360. Um, there were some people who didn't... How did this one work? There's some rounding stuff that happened weird with this one, but again, I went through and checked. And, you know, if you got, um, if you put in like one decimal place and didn't round, because it didn't say the number of um, decimal places that you should answer to, and Canvas is really picky, um, there was a possibility that you would put like 573.8 instead of 574. But I, I think I caught all of those. Again, you have your answers, so you can go back and check. If it was a rounding thing like that, um, then I will give those points back. So 574.9. And one of the things that you can think about too, um, I guess this is iron ore, as a check for a question like this, is our answer has to be bigger than the amount of iron ore that we're looking for. Because we know that the iron ore is only 60.9% iron. So if your number here wasn't bigger because you divided by 60.9 and you were off by a factor of 100, um, that would be how you sort of double check that as you're looking at that kind of question. It doesn't make sense that we could get, you know, 350 grams of iron out of 5.75 grams of iron. Uh, or sorry, this one's not or. So yeah, again, that was that. This was what the one place really where I saw that this problem with percentages came up. Difficulty with percentages. Okay. This is another question. Sorry, twenty-two here. Wait for it to pop up for you. 22 is one that um, I wrote incorrectly, but was corrected later. Um, and so you'll see on your, um, you'll see when you look at your test that it was regraded. Um, this was just, you know, solubility table, checking to make sure that that's an insoluble compound. Uh, molar mass of calcium nitrate. I think everybody got this one. Uh, the trick to this one is that you have to write the formula correctly first. So you have to know calcium, and you have to know that nitrate is NO3 minus. But again, right, you have access to your book, so you should have written out CaNO3 2, and then gotten the molecular weight or molecular mass for that. This is what I mean by uh, chaos. Um, back. Okay, so what is the correct name for uh, bromite? Ben, you do have access to your book. Um, this was just, you know, knowing that bromate is BrO3 minus, and so then removing one oxygen is uh, you change the ATE to ITE.
We have calcium nitrate again. So unfortunately, you can't go back and forth on your questions, but uh, you would have seen this either before or after that other one. And I didn't catch that I used that same compound twice, so I probably should have changed that. But um, This is the particularly tricky question. Um, part of the idea with doing a question like this is that it tests your ability to find the limiting reagent without using chemicals. Um, and therefore, because I made it up, it makes it a question that nobody can look up on check. Um, I did try to help you out a little bit here by high underlining pairs, how many pairs of rollerblades can be made. Um, so that was really the key to this one. And then you just had to multiply four wheels, three embroidered emblems, and one shoe. Multiply each of those by two. And then divide those respective numbers of components. Um, that the factory has by the number required to make each pair of shoes. That one was tricky, though. That one was really tricky. Um, this is a true-false question, right? Oxidation is a gain of electrons. It's false. Oil rig. Oxidation is loss. Um, this one, I think I should have been more clear on... Maybe I should have been more clear on this. I'm not sure. But when we talk about the oxidi oxidizing agent or the reducing agent, we're talking about the two reactants. Because this reaction is happening going from left to right, so the action is happening from left to right, a lot of people put tin on this, um, the tin metal. But that's working in the opposite direction. So if this was flipped, then tin would be the reducing agent. But because it's going from left to right, zinc is being oxidized, right? Zinc loses two electrons, so zinc is the reducing agent. Just another polyatomic ion. Practicing your naming with those. Um, this question, I'm pretty sure I talked about this in class, but um, the incredibly powerful thing about stoichiometry is that you can use it to find any quantity in a chemical equation. Um, I'm actually going to just I'm gonna screenshot this. And then we'll go over and we'll, we'll work this one out real quick. Because this was... Um, whatever. Okay, good. You can't see that. Okay. Right. Okay. So we're given we're given this reaction. Right. Gave you the balanced equation. And I said, how many grams of potassium nitrate are produced if fifteen point two six grams of lead iodide are also produced? Um, and then you're supposed to report your answer with two decimal places. So the key here, right, is that whenever we compare. Um, Whenever we compare two atoms or two molecules in a chemical reaction, we always have to go to moles first. And so you needed to, to take lead iodide and get the molecular weight for that. I should have a spreadsheet that does that somewhere. Um, but lead is 207, 207.2 uh, plus 2 times iodine, which is 126.2. Nine three. So you end up with four six one point oh six grams lead iodide per mole lead iodide. And remember that's mole of lead iodide atoms. Um, so then you take your fifteen fifteen point two six grams, right, multiplied by one mole over 461.06, right? And that'll give you your moles of lead iodide. So 15.26 divided by answer, you get something like 0 0.033.0976, right? We don't want to round until we get our final answer. 
So then we take that, and then we have to find the molecular weight of potassium nitrate. Or, well, there's one more step. 39.10 times, oh no, just plus. Nitrate is, or nitrogen is 14.01. And then there's three oxygens, right? So plus 16 times three. And we get that KNO3 is 101.11 grams per mole. So the other thing too, right, is that in our, in our uh, reaction here, we have one mole of lead iodide for every two moles of potassium nitrate. So we take our, right, this is moles lead iodide. I'm just going to use 0.331 just for the sake of not having to write that whole thing out. Um, and we're going to multiply it by two, <clears throat> two moles of potassium nitrate for every one mole lead iodide. And then we can do this uh, next conversion here, and we multiply by 101.11 grams of KNO3 for one mole. KNO3, right? Atoms there is implied. So we'll take this number of moles of lead iodide times 2 times 101.11. We get 6.69 grams of potassium nitrate. Does that make sense? So we could really do this for any of these, right? We could go from we go from lead iodide, and we could do potassium iodide. We could do um, lead nitrate, or like we just did potassium nitrate. Okay, moving on then. Uh, this was just a balancing balancing problem. Um, yeah, this one, if you had started by balancing HCl first, you would have done, right, balancing uh, chlorine first, you would have said two chlorines, and then you would have gotten, you know, your chlorines would be balanced, your hydrogens would be balanced, but then you have to check your oxygens, right, and so you could do two things here, you could multiply water by two, add a coefficient there, and then go through and change everything else, or you could say, well, we actually only need uh, sorry, let me change this again. We could also say that we, oh, we need half of a water, uh, or half of an oxygen gas, and then we need to multiply everything by two. So you end up with four as the coefficient on H HCl. <clears throat> this is another question. If you're, if you remember this question and you were confused by it, uh, it's because I've left off the mass that you were supposed to use to calculate this. Um, again, if you got that broken version of the question, um, you benefit from my mistake. But this is just converting from right grams to mils, or and one mil is equal to a centimeter cubed. So if you just take 62.30 grams and divide by 5.99, Uh, I do want to show how here. can we how can we tell if we because I got the broken version so how can I tell that I was that I got credit for that I think when you go to look at it it'll say regraded or you'll see that you got two points for it I think okay double check that again I did go through every test um, and okay. for for questions like that the way it works is I can just click on that one and hit regrade and that will change it for everybody right Everybody who got that version of the question will get the points. But I did go through every test to make sure that that wasn't 62.3. Um, right, so this would be the setup for this one. Again, just grams here, grams here. For conversion factors, right, we can flip these either way. I saw 
the, don't remember, I think it was the density lab, a lot of people messed this up, and they ended up multiplying grams by density. Um, but you divide here and you get 10.4. You get 10.4 centimeters cubed, and then, you know, if you want it, you can do the conversion, right, because it's one-to-one, -one, or you can just know that a centimeter cubed is one milliliter. This one was out of uh, chapter 8, I think it was in chapter 8, or it might have been chapter 16, right? So when we were talking about redox. For monoatomic ions, the oxidation state is the same as the charge. For a monoatomic ion. All right, so if you have an ion by itself, not as a part I of the I thought the charge on that was zero. For a monoatomic ion. I mean, I mean so the oxidation state on that is zero, right? Not for an ion. So ion equals a charge. So if we have a monoatomic ion, that would be like magnesium 2 plus. If we had a monoatomic atom, Mg without oh, a charge. Gosh. Yeah. Uh, another tricky trick, trickster. I mean, no, I guess. that's tricky. If you don't know what it, I mean, if you, you need to know what an ion is. Um, again, just a balancing, right? It's hard, it's hard to write questions for you to balance and then an give an answer that I know, so that I know you balanced it properly on a multiple choice question. Um, doing it this way lets, means I don't have to write out the entire problem. Um, some people did put like NaCl2, um, which, you know, sodium is a group one compound or group one element. So it's going to have a plus one charge and chlorine is a seven A group seven A. So it's going to have a minus one charge, right? So this is going to do one, to, this is going to be one to one. So two NaCl is the answer there. Um, these I thought were pretty straightforward, right? What's the what's the correct multiplier for kilo? Time ten to the three. For milli, ten to the minus three. And remember, like I have to put I have to put answers on here that are close to what could be the possible answer, um, because if I don't do that, it'll be obvious which one is the right answer. That's the the downside to multiple choice. Um, this one, okay, yeah. How many moles of hydrogen are there in 12 moles of C12H22? Let's go back to notability. Oh, okay. C12H22O12, right? And we have 12 moles. So we have 12 moles of this compound, and this compound has... Um, each of these has 22 atoms, then it's just going to be, so you could write it out like this, right? 22 hydrogens for 1 C12H22O12. So if you write 12 moles C12H22O22, sorry, 12, right? This will cancel. And we just get 12 times 22, which is 264, I think it was. And note here, I didn't say hydrogen gas. If I said hydrogen gas, that would involve some sort of reaction, but I'm just looking for the moles of hydrogen atoms. I should have been more clear about atoms, maybe. Um, all right, a sample is brought to your lab. Oh, right. <clears throat> you conduct an elemental analysis, right? And you get these percentages of uh, each of these atoms by mass. Um, a lot of people put the three C3H5.5O3, but the empirical formula is the smallest whole number for an atom or for a molecule. 
So that was C6, H11, O6, right? And so for this one, you have to convert again, right? You assume that you have either one gram or 100 grams or something. And then you convert each of the masses to moles. And then you use those moles to find the ratios between those. So then this was the follow-up to that, which, you know, these came out of order. But if you get the percent mass of each element in a compound, right, that lets you find the empirical formula. What piece of information is nece necessary to determine the molecular formula? Um, and that's the molecular weight. Molecular number was a decoy. Um, a lot of people fell for that one. Um, is it too confusing to have molecular weight versus molecular mass? I put molecular weight because when I took chemistry, that's what it was called. Um, but I think we talk more about molecular mass now, which is also more correct. So I'll be sure to do that in the future. Um, this is just a matching. I tried to give you a table because I can't do any formatting for some reason in these types of problems. Um, but I think the matching ones are generally uh, pretty straightforward, pretty easy to do. So um, I tried to give you a table here that, so you can more easily see that what's a subscript and what's a superscript. <clears throat> Most people got this one right. This is one that I was talking about. Um, a problem that I just threw, a question that I just threw together, and then I realized that Iron doesn't form a plus four oxidation state, you know, in nature. But the way you do these problems, well, you could probably could form a plus four. The way you do these problems, though, is that you, you're you using then, again, right, we start with fluorine, oxygen, um, sorry, fluorine, hydrogen, oxygen. Ooh, it took more time on this than I thought. Anyways, fluorine, hydrogen, oxygen. Right, and so oxygen is going to be minus two, plus one, minus one. And so you would see that you have iron and you have oxygen. So the oxidation state on every oxygen, if there's not hydrogen or fluorine, is minus two. So we get two times that minus two oxidation state. And that would give you a negative four, so you know that iron has to be plus four. And I try to throw in these ones, right, where it's asking for iron, and I spell out the word iron, right, making sure that you can do those from time to time as well. <clears throat> the last problem, this one was just, this one was tricky. I should not have put, maybe I shouldn't have, I don't know. My, I wanted to test if you could see that it was a precipitation reaction and predict the, predict the, proper product, which is the two silver bromide solid, because it's a precipitation reaction. A lot of people put two silver bromide aqueous. So that one was tricky. But again, testing did look, you know, the idea there is that you see this, you check your solubility table, and find that it's a precipitation reaction. Uh, the average for this test was 74, uh, which honestly, uh, you know, talking with other professors, um, the average on the second test is usually a 50%, or 60%. Um, so I don't know if that means I wrote the test too easy, or it could be that you guys are doing great. Uh, I prefer to believe the later, because there were a lot of tricky questions in there. Um, and there are a lot of difficult concepts, and I feel like the questions, albeit tricky, did test those concepts. Um, yeah. There is another survey up, if you want to yell at me on the survey. It's anonymous. Um, I think I posted it. It's under the home module on Canvas. So if you want to go say mean, mean things to me on the... The survey, you're welcome to go do that. If you want to say nice things, I'd appreciate it. If you have constructive criticism, that's very much appreciated. 
Okay, so we got to get into now chapter 10. Are there any other questions about the test before we do that? Okay. Chemistry is a, is a tricky subject. Um, it's just a tricky subject. There's a lot of minutia. There's a lot of details. There are a lot of things that you have to be looking for. So sometimes it's just the nature of the beast. But today we're going to talk about chemical bonding. And hopefully this will combine with what we've learned previously and reinforce that because we'll be learning some of the scientific theory behind why calcium forms, well, some more of the theory, because we already talked about, right, with the periodic table, that was yesterday's lecture. On the periodic table, um, why calcium or magnesium form two plus ions, why chlorine forms a minus, uh, one minus ion. We're going to talk today more about how those valence electrons interact to produce the bonds that we see. And it should help also when we're looking at ionic or covalent compounds for why they form the number of bonds that they do with the atoms that they do. Um, this is one of the cool sort of examples of what we can do with this knowledge of the way molecules bond and the way that they interact. In 1989, researchers discovered the structure of HIV protease, right? Human immunovirus. Bonding theories were used to simulate how potential drug molecules would interact with the HIV protease molecule. And then this is um, on that screen there is the HIV protease with uh, indinavir, which is a protease inhibitor. So it's a molecule that fits, and it's right here in this pocket. It fits into that pocket in such a way that means that the protease um, cannot interact with the human molecules that it wants to interact with. And it inhibits it. Um, I do you want to make a short plug for Fold It or Folding at Home, um, which uses cloud computing to do this kind of thing for uh, current drug targets, right? I think HIV is still one of them. Uh, COVID was one of them for a long time, probably still is. Um, basically, it uses your computer when you're not around to calculate how these different molecules will fit, or these. it also calculates the structure of the proteins that make up things like the COVID spike protein or um, things like HIV protease. Um, and by using lots of computers networked together, we can get way more computing power to try and calculate these things and find new drugs for things like COVID or for um, HIV. <clears throat> so we use these bond theories to predict how atoms bond together to form molecules. Um, we can predict what combinations of atoms form compounds and what combinations do not form compounds. And we can predict formulas of compounds. Um, that also helps to explain the shapes of molecules which also determines many of their physical and chemical properties, right? We talked very early on, like day one, about water. Actually, we should do it like this. Oxygen's red, right? We've got our two little hydrogen atoms, right? Just drawing them as atoms. And they form this bent shape, right? And it's that bent shape that causes water to be, as we'll learn later, polar, um, and what gives it a lot of its properties. And... So the simplest model we have for this is Lewis theory, which uses valence electrons. So in Lewis theory, the valence electrons of main group elements are represented as dots surrounding the symbol of the element. The result is called a Lewis structure, or a dot structure, and the number of valence electrons for any main group element, except helium, is equal to the group number of the element. Right. So if we have, um, I don't know why I'm using magnesium so much, Magnesium is group two. So magnesium has two valence electrons, right? And we draw that just like this. You could do um, like this, or really any combination, just have the electrons, right? Two electrons around it, um, but not paired, which I believe was Hund's rule, that we don't pair electrons until we have to. Um, or if you did do something like oxygen, which is group 6A, right? It's going to have six. One, two, three, four. We draw the se them separately first. 
and then we can combine some electrons. So this would be the Lewis structure for oxygen. So let's do it like this though, right? Because we'll use the electron configuration. Um, I'll pull up the periodic table and you can follow along there a little bit. Let's use the other periodic table. It's a little easier to see. Um, right, so we've got hydrogen, helium, so that's one, S, two. And then we go to that, the next one, which is two S, two, and then two, P oxygen is in the fourth column of the P block, right? So that yellow block is the P block. So we're in P4. And now one, right, is in the first shell. So then we look at these in the two shell, right? The highest <clears throat> um, primary quantum number, right? The shell, shell number. And we can see that we have six electrons. So then our Lewis structure for oxygen has six electrons. And again, we write the individual electrons first, and then we pair electrons. So each dot on one of these Lewis dot structures uh, represents one of our valence electrons. And we, do, we place them around the element symbol with a maximum of two per side. And like I said before, the location of the dots isn't critical. Um, but we do fill them singly first, right, one at a time, and then pair them. Uh, we're not doing mastering chemistry. Atoms with eight valence electrons are particularly stable, right? We talked about having that full shell is where most, uh, is where atoms really want to be. And that eight dots is called an octet, right? Octet for eight. Oct. <clears throat> so let's do each of these. I should have left the periodic table up. Let's do each of these. Um, so helium, right, is the exception to its group number because it's over an eight. Um, helium just gets two electrons, right? Because its, <clears throat> it's um, electron configuration is just one S2. So starting with hydrogen, though, we get one electron. Helium then, right, being the exception to the rule, gets two electrons. Lithium then, again, right, so for we got hydro or helium here. If we just continue on to lithium, that'll be 2s1. So lithium only has one valence electron, right? Because it only has one electron in the 2s <clears throat> uh, shell, in the second shell. For beryllium, right? Now instead of 2s1, we have 2s2, two valence electrons. And you can kind of see where this pattern is going, right? So boron is in group 3A. It's going to have three electrons. Carbon's going to be in group 4A. Nitrogen in group 5A. And nitrogen is a weird one because it has five. Really, nitrogen, every, everything in group 5A. Um, oxygen then, right? We already did oxygen. Fill these singly first and then add in the rest. Fluorine is in seven. Oh, see, I broke my own rule. Four, five, six, seven. And then for neon, well, I guess I can cheat here because we know neon is an eight, and so it's going to have eight electrons, and that's the full octet. Then helium is kind of the exception being, right, it has a duet. It only needs two electrons. <clears throat> so in our Lewis theory, a chemical bond involves the sharing or transfer of electrons to attain stable electron configurations for the bonding atoms, right? That's going to mean octets. So ionic bonds, when you have an ionic bond, we're transferring electrons from our non-metal, sorry, from our metal to our non-metal. In a covalent bond, the electrons are shared. So, right, the octet rule is that in chemical bonding, atoms transfer or share electrons to obtain outer shells with eight electrons, hydrogen, lithium, and beryllium follow the duet rule because they're so close to helium. So lithium and beryllium are going to lose one and two electrons respectively to have the same electron configuration as helium. <clears throat> um. 
So let's write the Lua structures then for magnesium and sulfur. So we write magnesium. Should just leave the periodic table up. Magnesium, right, is in group two, so it has two electrons. So give him two or give it two electrons. Sulfur is under oxygen in group six or group yeah group six, six a. So we give it one, two, three, four, five, six. Is it the next slide that we talk about this? All right, well, we'll come back to this in a second, right? So that those are the Lewis structures for both of those. And you might be able to see already how these are going to combine, because we can also think of, you know, magnesium in the way that we've been talking about it before, it has a two plus charge, and sulfur has a two, or generally forms a two minus charge. And you can see where that comes from here, because the magnesium, well, well, the magnesium is going to share both, or is basically going to give both of these electrons to sulfur, so that it can go back to a electron configuration the same as neon. And sulfur, right, wants to gain two electrons to have the same electron configuration as argon. So when metals bond with nonmetals, <clears throat> electrons are transferred from the metal to the nonmetal. So the metal becomes a cation and the nonmetal becomes an anion. The attraction between the cation and the anion res results in a, an anionic compound. All right, so we showed this kind of already. If we use magnesium, I'm going to draw them over here, and then we'll have sulfur. We'll do one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so we're transferring these electrons over to sulfur, and we'll get Mg, uh, Mg2 plus, and sulfur with its now full octet when we draw anions, we draw a bracket around them. So it's two minus. So let's write the Lewis structures then for potassium and chlorine, and we'll show that electron transfer again when they bond. All right, so potassium. Potassium has, um, is in column one. So potassium. Give it its one electron. We'll draw chlorine with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we're going to see that right this electron goes over here to fill up that empty slot, and that gives chlorine an octet. So we get K plus, and then we have chlorine with all eight electrons here with a minus charge. Right, so our chloride ion gets its octet. Potassium loses its only valence electron, but that gives it an octet in the previous shell, which is now the valence shell, right? The same as argon. And the Lewis structure of an anion, right, we write it within brackets, like I did just there, and we put the charge in the upper right corner outside of those brackets. You do another one of these examples, right? These are these are pretty easy. Of sodium, um, right? So currently we're using the group number to figure out how many valence electrons each of these gets. You can also use its electron configuration, right? So for sodium, we would start with neon because we don't need to write the whole thing out. And then we can see in the next row that our first valence shell, our first electron from the valence shell is going to be 3s1, and that gives us the electron configuration for sodium, and write that S and that 1 as a superscript is the number of electrons in that shell or in that orbital. So we've got sodium with 1, and then we'll do bromine, right? We could do bromine also the same way. We do argon, and then we would do um, row 4. So just going to do the, right, 4. S2, right, because it's going to be cal potassium and calcium. And then we do have, you know, 3D10, right, because we go back back a step for the Ds when we get to 4. Um, 
but those aren't valence electrons, right? They're in a lower shell, they're lower energy than our 4s and what's going to be our 4p5, right? Because bromine is in the fifth column of the p block. And so looking at just our valence electrons here, we get two and five, so that's seven, All right? But the shortcut is to look at the periodic table um, and whatever group it's in for the main block elements is the number of valence electrons. So we get sodium, bromine, right? And we can see that if we transfer just this one electron, now we end up with Na plus, and we get a very happy Br minus, right? Full octet. Full octet, you're set. Lewis theory also predicts the chemi correct chemical formulas for ionic compounds. So if we do barium fluoride, we'll get to this in a second, but one of the rules for writing these out is that we um, always want symmetry, or almost always want symmetry. Right, so fluorine's in seven. We do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I always try to leave them, you know, if there's missing electrons, put them on the side with the element that they're going to be bonding with. Barium is in two. So it's one, two. And then for fluorine again, right? We can just mirror this on the other side. We can see that barium can give up one electron each to each fluorine and form those bonds to get barium two plus, and then we get two F minuses. So this predicts then, you know, in addition to when we talk about these um, charges, right, we talk about how 7A has a minus one charge and group 2A has a plus two charge. That is coming from these Lewis dot structures. And this is why they form those charges. Because they want their electron configurations to be octets, or like we said with hydrogen, lithium, and beryllium, they want to be duets. So, uh, <clears throat> right, let's, let's use Lewis theory then to predict what happens when we have magnesium and nitrogen. Okay, so we have magnesium, do one nitrogen. Magnesium has, it's in column two, so it has two electrons. Nitrogen has five, one, two, three, four, five. Um, right? So neither of these can get an octet from just bonding with one of each other. But if we remember the crisscross rule, right? So we know that magnesium likes to form a two plus charge. Nitrogen likes to form a three minus charge. So then we can crisscross these and we know we're gonna have three magnesiums and two nitrogens. So then we do, let's just put another nitrogen up here and we'll do another magnesium. I'll put the electrons like this. Because now we can see that if we take these electrons and we start distributing them, right, we can give one there, give one here, put one there, and this one will donate up here, here, and here, so that we end up with basically these two, we end up with two nitrogens, so you can also write it like this, two nitrogens that have full octets and this three minus charge, and we'll get three magnesiums, if I can write, with two plus charges. Because each of these magnesiums is giving up both of its electrons, uh, both of their electrons to the nitrogens. All right, so this Lewis dot uh, Lewis theory then predicts why that these bonds form like this. In addition to, right, we kind of saw like, um, again, to go way back, we can think about these in terms of our, our laws, right? A scientific law is that we can use this crisscross method to get the correct configuration. The Lewis theory is a theory, and therefore it explains why we, why that happens, right? Why we're forming this three to two ratio of magnesium to nitrogen. Um, and it's because of the way that they can share their electrons or transfer their electrons in the case of these ionic compounds.
when we have nonmetals bonding with other non mon mon uh, nonmetals bonding with other nonmetals, we form a molecular compound, right? When we talked about our naming schemes, that was what, that was what we learned there as a rule. Um, molecular compounds contain covalent bonds, and in covalent bonds, the electrons are shared. So in Lewis theory, we represent these covalent bonds um, by neighboring atoms sharing some of their valence electrons to attain octets. So let's take a look at hydrogen and oxygen. All right, so hydrogen, oxygen. You know hydrogen has one. Oxygen's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. So we can see hydrogen has one electron. Oxygen has six. Oxygen wants two more electrons to have an octet. So to follow the symmetry rule, which we'll cover later, we'll add another hydrogen to the other side. And instead of transferring this electron from the hydrogen to the oxygen, what we'll do is we'll rewrite this as hydrogen. Those are the two electrons. Actually, here, let me do this. Make this a little more clear, right? We have hydrogen with these red electrons. So hydrogen with its red electron, one of oxygen's black electrons. Put these up here. And then again here, one, one oxygen, one electron from oxygen, the other one from hydrogen. So now they're sharing their electrons. And so we count these shared electrons towards the octet or duet of each atom that's sharing. So hydrogen here has its two electrons. Oxygen, sharing one electron with both hydrogens, has eight electrons. So it gets its octet. And then this other hydrogen has its duet. Right, so those shared electrons count for both. And those are covalent bonds. <clears throat> so we call these shared electrons a bonding pair. So they're bonding pair electrons. Um, and then the electrons that aren't shared, that are only on one atom, those are lone pair electrons. So if we were to rewrite this um, with lines, because we often show our bonding pair electrons as lines, we would write it like this, with these lone pair electrons on water, or on, on oxygen. So there, each line is two electrons. <clears throat> so Lewis theory also explains why the halogens, right, and hydrogen and helium, I guess helium is a halogen. Or, uh, no, no, sorry, not helium. The halogens and helium, or in hydrogen, the halogens and hydrogen form diatomic molecules. So if we look at bromine, the Br, Br, right, because we know we're forming a diatomic. Br is in column seven, so it has seven electrons. And I'll do these ones in red. Right? So each of these have seven. So if we can share one electron each to form a bond, now each of these has eight electrons or an octet. Because right, we count this, this is two electrons. So two plus the six, lone, six electrons in lone pairs on each of these equals eight. Right? And so hydrogen also does a similar thing in that each hydrogen wants an octet and each hydrogen has one atom or one electron. So then we get that shared electron to give them both a duet. Right? So that's why it's hydrogen and then the halogens that form these diatomics. Um, we'll get to why oxygen also forms a diatomic. But it's slightly different. Actually, we'll do it right now. So atoms can share more than an electron pair, electron pair to attain an octet. So if we have oxygen, right? So we know oxygen each has six from the periodic table. So instead of just sharing one electron each, they each throw in two electrons. So we get oxygen with a double bond.
right? And each one of these lines counts as two electrons, so that's four electrons in the bond, plus four electrons in lone pairs, gives them each an octet. Does that hold true for like sulfur and selenium, et cetera, as well? Um, things get a little more complicated as you move down, right? Because sulfur doesn't form diatomics. It doesn't form like a diatomic like oxygen does. Um, but almost any uh, atom can form double bonds. Hydrogen can't form double bonds because it only has one electron, right? So it doesn't have two to share. Um, okay. In theory, oh, yeah, yeah. Can you're form talking about bonds. the Brinkle hop, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So this explains why oxygen does that. I think when you get to larger, uh, larger and larger atoms, as you start adding more and more electron shells, um, the ability to form a double bond with itself decreases, but does happen. It's just that oxygen in nature is always found as a diatomic. Right, so each oxygen has then an octet because the additional bonding pair counts towards both of the oxygen atoms. Um, right, and double bonds, you can think about these bonds between, right, so if we just had an um, oxygen single bond, then, you know, each of these would not have an octet, but this, you can think about these bonds kind of like bungee cords that hold them together. When you, ha when you go from a single bond to a double bond, let me try and like, write, like show this too, that bond is stronger, right? You've added another bungee cord pulling them together, so those bonds are actually shorter. And they are more stable because you've added that extra strength of another... Um... Oh, it looks like we lost somebody for a second there. So... Yeah, double bonds are shorter and stronger, just like if you added a second bungee cord. Really, if you added a second bungee cord to two people trying to w run away from each other, right? Because the nuclei, the nuclei of the um, oxygen atoms are both positive, and the electron clouds are also negative, but they're going to try and push each other away. But if you add a second bond in here to tie them together, that pulls them closer. So we are given a few numbers here. Um, if you have an oxygen-oxygen single bond, it's 121 picometers, or a double bond, it's 121 picometers, and 148 for a single bond. But we can take it one step further than that. If we get nitrogen, each nitrogen has five electrons. And so for each nitrogen to have a octet here, we have to not only share one, not only two, but we have to share three electrons from each of them. And so, you know, you can write it out as bonds, or you could do something silly like this, right? So we've got three pairs of electrons in there, or we'd write triple bonds like so. And each nitrogen atom, right, because we have six here, this is six electrons, and then we have a lone pair so plus that lone pair is going to give each of these an octet. And that makes nitrogen gas actually very, very, very stable. Um, it's not one of the Brinkelhoff compounds, but when you do get nitrogen gas, it's very stable, very inert. Um, and we use it for a lot of things. Now this triple bond, as you may have guessed if you're thinking ahead here, that the triple bond is even shorter and stronger than a double bond, right? Now we've got six electrons involved. We've essentially got three bungee cords pulling these two nuclei together. And so this nitrogen nitrogen triple bond is 110 picometers, while the double bond is 124. Like I just said, very stable, very stable molecule. <clears throat> but in nature, nitrogen is most often found in other compounds, um, which is why it's not one of the Brinkelhoff compounds. So we can also use, um, right, remember we talked about skeletal structures um, very briefly, they're just sort of mentioned. So this would be like CH4. The skeletal structure for CH4 would look something like this. 
we've got carbon, and we've got all of the bonds. Um, and it shows us the relative positions of these atoms. Uh, a rule to remember, hydrogen atoms are almost always terminal atoms, right? They only have one electron. Um, so they can only really form one bond. But, and many molecules tend to be symmetrical. So when a mole and when a molecule contains several atoms of the same type, these tend to be in terminal positions, which there are many exceptions to that, but in general, especially in this class. <clears throat> so that's kind of our first step, is we want to look at it, um, construct a skeletal structure for the molecule, we want things to be symmetrical. Hydrogen atoms are going to be on the ends. Then we want to calculate the total number of electrons for the Lewis structure by summing the valence electrons of each atom in the molecule. Oh, chat. Oh, yeah, sorry. Let's, uh, let's take a break real quick. Um, yeah, I need to be better about remembering those. So we're back at uh, 1, or 11.26. 11.26.
Okay. <clears throat> I'm back. Here we go. Keep on moving. So let's calculate, and then, and then, right. So we talked about, right, out a skeletal structure, even if it doesn't include bonds like this, although that is kind of part of it, right? We want to write out something that's going to look like, something what we think will look like the final compound. Um, putting hydrogens on the end, trying to make things as symmetrical as possible. And then you want to calculate your total number of electrons for the Lewis structure by summing the valence electrons for each atom in the molecule. All right, so if we had if we had something like CH4, right? Carbon is in group 4A. So that's going to be, right, this is kind of like doing your molecular mass. Um, carbon equals 4 electrons. Hydrogen equals 1 electron, right, because it's the 1A. And then this will be times 1, right, times 4. And so we'll get a total of 8 electrons. <clears throat> and then if we had an ion for that ion, so if we did something like NO3 minus, right, you add one electron for each negative charge, and you subtract one electron for each positive charge. Um, so for a positive charge, if you had something like NH4 plus, you'd have an, elect an extra proton, or you'd lose an extra electron there because there's a positive charge. Then we take those electrons, giving octets or duets to as many atoms as possible. But you want to begin by placing two electrons between each pair of atoms. Got a message. Okay. Somebody's saying they won't be able to get the homework in on time. Um, if you do, for those here, need an extension on something, we're very willing to work. Uh, work with that because um, it's all submitted digitally so it all goes to the same place um, usually takes me a while to get to it anyway and especially with homeworks um, if you really need it ask anyways um, so you want to begin by placing two electrons between each pair of atoms right okay so we're doing kind of working with CH4 in this example we already calculated on the previous slide that we have a total of eight electrons so if we've written out our skeletal as something like this, knowing that the hydrogens need to be terminal, knowing that we want it to be symmetrical, then we would take our electrons and we place them each in between to form those bonds, right? That's the minimum number of electro bonding electrons is two. Then we distribute the remaining electrons. In this example, we have no remaining electrons. Um, but you want to start on the outside and then moving to the central atom giving octets to as many atoms as possible, right? Because the central atoms are going to be bonded to something else. They're already going to have most of their electrons, or they'll have more than the terminal ones do. Um, and then if we have any atoms that lack octets, after using up all of our oxygens, we form double or triple bonds as necessary to give them octets, right? And so we do this by taking a lone pair from a terminal atom and we put it into the bonding region with the central atom to form a double bond. Um, I think this is the next example, but if you had something like, um, well, we'll just do it for the next, we'll do it for the example, right? So carbon monoxide, right? CO. So you have carbon, and this one's easy, right? For a skeletal structure, we're just going to write carbon, oxygen. There's only two, so it doesn't really matter where we put them. Um, and then we want to say that carbon has four electrons, oxygen has six electrons, right, because 4A and 6A. So and we only have one of each. We don't have any charges. We're not working with an ion here. So we just have 10 electrons to distribute. So we start with our bonding electrons, right, because we know we're going to need a bond there. <clears throat> and then both of these are terminal, right? They're they're not attached to anything else. So we can just start throwing electrons in here, right? So we use two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And we can see that we've run out of electrons. But carbon doesn't have an octet. So what we do is we take them from the atom that has more bond more electrons. And we can take one of these lone pairs and we'll throw him into the bond. 
So we now see carbon, and we've moved these two electrons. Had two electrons there already. Now oxygen has still has an octet, but carbon, right? We uh, use this. We have one, two, three, four, five, six. Carbon still only has six electro or six, um, yeah, six electrons. So we'll take another one of these lone pairs and we'll move it into the middle. And then we'll get carbon, right? Now we've moved two of these lone pairs in. We had a lone pair, or we had a pair there to begin with. <clears throat> and now if we count, we have six, seven, eight. And then to count for oxygen, we have six, seven, eight. Both of these have octets now. And you can see too how when we took this lone pair, we did this step here, and we took this lone pair from the oxygen, put it in the middle, we didn't actually change the fact that oxygen had an octet because those electrons were just shared. So it still has an octet. And same thing here, when we took these and moved them to the bonding area, oxygen still maintained its octet. We just added an octet, we just added ox or shared electrons to carbon so that both of them could have an octet. And finally, you would write this as carbon triple bonded to oxygen with our lone pairs on the outside. Not too crazy. Now, this is where maybe you need to get a little bit creative with drawing your, um, your, your structures. So carbon, as a general rule, carbon is going to be a central atom. Carbon likes to be in the middle of things. Um, <clears throat> and we want things to be symmetrical, right? So let's, let's, let's look at a few different ways we could write this out. We say carbon, we know hydrogens are going to be terminal, uh, but maybe it's bonded to an oxygen. And so you could start from here, knowing that the hydrogens are, hydrogens are going to be terminal. We could put a hydrogen here maybe and a hydrogen here, but this is not symmetrical, right? We have carbon and oxygen uh, on either side. Sure, we added a hydrogen to either side, but we can be more symmetrical than this. We do carbon. Do a hydrogen and a hydrogen. So let me put a little more space. Hydrogen and a hydrogen, and then the oxygen over here. Right, so now we have a plane of symmetry, even though it may be a little bit hard to see, but this way. Oh, and one note. Yep. Right? So we have our plane of symmetry just like that. And that's the most symmetrical, that's as symmetrical as we can get. So I'm trying to make this sideways again. Actually, here, this is what I'll do. Let me copy this. Right, so that shows our symmetry. We're going to work with this one over here. Okay, so now that we've written out a skeletal structure, and you don't have to get this right the first time, too. It's easier if you get it right, um, the skeletal structure, that is. But you will see that if you don't get the skeletal structure right, you might run into problems later down the road when you start adding electrons. Um, so we got hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. Right. So hydrogen is going to have one electron. Carbon's got four electrons. Oxygen has six electrons. And then we just count how many of each, right? So we have two hydrogens, one, and one. And so we'll get 10, 12 electrons, right? So that's counting up the number of valence electrons that we have at our disposal. And now we distribute them, right? And we start with our bonding electrons. And then we go to terminal atoms to add electrons first. <clears throat> and here, notice that hydrogens, right? Hydrogen only wants a duet, so we're going to add them to the. We're going to add these extra electrons to the oxygen. We've already used six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Now we need to go back and check: Does everything have an octet? So oxygen, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Easy enough. 
Actually, let me. Oh, I can't. I can't redo. Okay. And then let's count for hydrogen one or for carbon one, two, three, four, five, six. So since we only have six on carbon, again, we're going to pull those electron lone pairs from our terminal atom and add them to the bond between that terminal atom and our central atom, which needs more electrons. Oh, excuse me. So we can take these electrons. Actually, let me write it this way because it'll, it'll look clearer. We're going to take these electrons and we're going to move them into this bond. All right, so we got one, we got our hydrogen. I'm going to switch these over to bonds. All right? We'll leave these as the electrons so that they're easier to count. Oxygen. All right? And then these two actually are two of these are from that lone pair. Right? And so we can count these again. For carbon, this is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then if we count for hydrogen, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we do have our duets for our hydrogens. We have a octet for carbon and an octet for oxygen. And then our final structure is going to look something like this. With our lone pairs. I guess we haven't gotten to why those are at an angle like that yet, but we will. All right, lone pairs on the oxygen. <clears throat> so when we do this for polyatomic ions. Um, it's the same procedure, but we need to pay attention to the charge, right? We talked about how that charge either adds one electron for negative charge or subtracts one electron, right, from our pool of valence electrons subtracts one electron for each positive charge. And then we show the Lewis structure for a polyatomic ion with brackets and write the charge of the ion in the upper right corner outside of the brackets, right? We already did this a little bit for like chlorine and bromine. Um, well, let's do it now for a polyatomic ion. So we have carbon. And again, right, we have only two atoms, so we can kind of throw them on the page in whatever order. Um, and then we'll count our number of electrons. So carbon, nitrogen, uh, can't use V for vanadium. Uh, I'll use CH for charge. <clears throat> okay, so carbon has four electrons. Nitrogen has five electrons, right? Group 5A. And then our charge is minus one, so that's going to be an extra one electron. So if we add these up, we get a total of 10 electrons. And now we just add them into our uh, skeletal structure, right? And so we're going to add them to our bond first. Um, and then we can add them, right? Both of these are terminal, so that's one, two. We'll just add them over here, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, I'll go over here, nine, ten. All right, and again, we don't have enough. So we've got eight now for nitrogen. We only have four for carbon. And <clears throat> we can skip a few steps here instead of doing the stepwise and moving one pair at a time, right? Because when we move one of these lone pairs into this bond, nitrogen doesn't lose any electrons. It's just sharing them now. So we can see that carbon has four, and we need eight. So we know we're going to move two lone pairs, right, four electrons, into this bond. So we've got carbon, right, four, or there's six electrons in there, all paired, or all bonding. So we have a triple bond, and then nitrogen. And then we add our charge, right, we do brackets, and then the charge goes on the outside. Again, right? So we got Cl O minus, just two electrons or just two atoms. So we'll just throw them in here, and then we'll say we have chlorine, oxygen, and then we have a charge. <clears throat> and so then our charge, right? Or well, chlorine is in group seven A, 
Uh, so it has seven electrons. Oxygen is in group 6A, so it has six electrons. And then our charge is one more electron. So we have a total then of, not 17, but 14 electrons. And again, we just add these in, one, two, right, to our bond first, and then one, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So this one's a little bit simpler than the last one, but we do Cl, and we change those electrons into a bond, oxygen, and then we add in our lone pairs, brackets, and our charge. Polyatomic ions. You just gotta make sure you pay attention to that charge, and if you wanna skip the step, Right? If you wanted to just write these as a bonding pair, right, a line, you can do that. Just remember that each of those lines counts as two electrons. It's just a lot of bookkeeping. <clears throat> so there are a couple, couple exceptions to the octet rule. Um, for example, nitrogen. It is impossible to write good Lewis structures for molecules with odd numbers of electrons because you end up with this, uh, just highlight it, a single electron. Um, so you just do the best, you write the best Lewis structure that you can and know that we've got this one unpaired electron. Another significant exception to the octet rule is boron. Boron will form compounds with only six electrons around boron rather than eight. Um, that's just the way boron does. So that's the one that you, those are the two that you kind of need to remember. Right? And I mentioned nitrogen earlier as having five electrons, which is weird. Boron, again, three electrons, also does weird stuff. Um, <clears throat> but it only holds for three and five. Right, So boron will form these compounds with just three things attached to it, and it'll only have six. There are a couple other exceptions here, too, when we have things like sulfur, uh, and phosphorus, they can form these expanded octets um, where they bond with more than just, you know, what gives them an octet. Um, but yeah, these, these exceptions are few enough and far enough between that Lewis theory works for the majority of compounds. <clears throat> and actually, as an example, right, on a test... I might ask, put one of these compounds and ask, hey, how many, how many valence electrons does phosphorus have? Right? You just have to count them. You know, so phosphorus here has 10, sulfur has 10. Or, sorry, sulfur has 12. Right? So just use those core, you know, your core um, skills that we're learning here. Things like, you know, bonds are two electrons each, and then you can figure out... Um, how many valence electrons this are going to have. <clears throat> now, there's another sort of layer on this. Um, for some molecules, such as SO2, right? So let's write the, um, the Lewis structure for SO2. I'll just go ahead and write... Oh, no, let's, let's do this properly, right? The more examples, the better. So we have um, sulfur... And again, right, we have more oxygens than we do sulfurs, so our oxygens are probably going to be terminal. So we'll go oxygen, oxygen, right, sulfur, oxygen, sulfur has six, oxygen has six, but this is times one, times two. So we're going to get basically, or well, not basically, we're going to get 18 electrons. So we'll start one, two, three, four, and then we go to our terminal electrons to or terminal atoms to fill those electrons in. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Right? So sulfur here, right? Oxygen, that's eight electrons. Oxygen over here, right? We're symmetrical too, so it also has eight electrons. But sulfur only has six electrons. <clears throat> if this was boron, maybe we would say, oh, well, it's boron, so boron can do six electrons, but it's sulfur. Um, 
So we need to take one of these lone pairs from one of the oxygens to make an extra double, or to make a double bond, right? To make an extra bond. The question though is which one, right? Which oxygen do we take that lone pair from? And actually, when you look at these compounds in nature, right, I'll just write it like this. So if we do the right one, or we could do the left one. Just add all these lone pairs in, right? <clears throat> these are equivalent. You know, the, there's, there's no, aside from which oxygen it is, there's no difference between these two. And so what we, we call this a resonance structure or resonance. Um, and you write that with like this. Showing that this, <clears throat> this electron pair can be on either side. So actual SO2 in nature exists as an average of the two Lewis structures neither one alone represents reality. So these, the bonds then between them, right, because we talked about double bonds are shorter than single bonds and triple bonds are even shorter, um, are even shorter than double bonds. So the length of this bond actually between the sulfur and oxygen in nature is actually an intermediate between the length of a single bond and the length of a double bond. It's a hybrid, right? It's like we've taken the single single bond dog and the double bond dog, and we formed this new hybrid dog that has really some of the properties of each. <clears throat> right, so these are the two resonance structures like I drew out before. <clears throat> And you'll write them both. Actually, this is this is how I want them written, really, um, for this class, right? Each of these, and then with this double-sided arrow in between, showing that it's transferring between the two of these. Which is just to account for the electrons in Lewis theory, because the true structure is actually some hybrid. All right, so we're going to do, we've got another resonance structure. We're going to have nitrogen. And again, because we have more oxygens than we have nitrogens, those are going to be our terminal atoms. We'll say nitrogen, oxygen, um, and then we do have a charge, right? We're working with an ion. Five electrons, six electrons, right? Group 5A, group 6A. Our charge is minus one, so it's going to be one extra electron. And that'll give us 12 total electrons. And so we'll just start by 1, 2, 3, 4. Again, then moving from our bonds to our terminal atoms. 1, so 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Right? And we can see that we don't have enough electrons uh, to make octets on either of these. At this point, um, Right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. At this point, I would um, redistribute these electrons so that we had even numbers of electrons on our oxygens. Uh, right, because at least for now, it says include resonance structures, so we know there's probably going to be a, there. Well, I know there's going to be a resonance structure. So we have our oxygens are both short um, electrons and our nitrogen is short electrons. So we're gonna use these, um, actually it didn't go over this example. So we're gonna add these electrons from this oxygen. This is the same as the last one. You just put uh, oh, one line. Oh, I missed the six. Yeah, there should be 18. There should be 18, I didn't multiply it by two. I was like, this isn't going to work. 18 electrons. Okay, right, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Right, and it's going to end up being the same. 
as the other one, right? Because we're going to take these electrons and add them to this bond. So we're going to get nitrogen, the double bond to oxygen. And then we're going to get the resonance form, which is going to be the opposite of that. All right, with all of our lone pairs. And then since each of these is an ion. On the, on the, oh, on the, on the double side, double bond side, you need to take, take off one of those. Oh, wait. Never Ready? mind, just kidding. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, right. So, 18 electrons, and this works out. All right, so we get our resonance structures. And once you've drawn one, you can draw the other. The key is then identifying, right, that you can make this multiple ways. And part of that comes from symmetry, right? So in, um, in this version up here, we first wrote it out, we can see that we can take electrons from the right oxygen, but we could also take them from the left oxygen. And both would end up with octets for all. So, these molecules don't exist in two-dimensional space, right? We've been writing them out on paper, but those aren't the true shapes of the molecules. We use this valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, or I will call it VESPER, even though you would correctly identify that it's VESPER. VESPER is easier to say. So this VESPER theory is based on the idea that electron groups repel each other. So each of these counts as one counts as one electron group. We have a lone pair, a single bond, a double bond, and a triple bond. Those all count as one electron group. And it's the repulsion between the negative charges of electron groups on the central atom that determines the geometry of the molecule. So everything wants to be as spaced out as possible in three-dimensional space. <clears throat> so let's predict the shape then of right, carbon dioxide we're given the Lewis structure here. And what you're looking at when you're trying to determine this um, geometry for Vesper theory is the central atom. Oops. So, all right, we have um, lone pairs, bonds, whether they be double, single, or triple bonds. Um, am I missing something? Yeah, lone pair or bonds, right? These are our two electron groups. So when we're counting the groups around that central atom, we're going to see that we have a double bond and a double bond, and we don't have any lone pairs. So we just have two bond bonds, which count as our two electron groups. So if we have two electron groups to get as far away from each other as possible, they're 180 degrees. They're, right, they're on exact opposite sides of the carbon. Each of these is our oxygen. And so whenever you have two electron groups, you have a linear geometry. Two electron groups, linear geometry. It's a little bit more complicated as we add more groups and lone pairs, but the next simplest shape, <clears throat> and this one too, right? This is somewhat two-dimensional, right? It doesn't matter if we rotate this around, uh, you know, if we're looking down that bond, it's like, it's like my Apple Pencil, right? I can spin this and it doesn't change the way it looks. You spin this this way and it doesn't change the way it looks. It's essentially two dimensional. Um, here again, right, we've got to count our electron groups, I'll highlight them in red. We've got a bond here, a bond here, and a bond here, and we don't have any lone pairs. So, right, we have lone pairs and bonds. We have bonds, B-O-N-D-S. So we have three bonds, zero lone pairs. That's three electron groups on the central atom. This forms a trigonal planar geometry. So... I should have three pens that I could hold or something, but yeah, so if I, these are my three things that I have on hand, right? 
So they're forming this where they're as far apart as possible. But it's flat, right? So if you looked at it edge on, that's why it's trigonal. Trig, tri, is three. Planar, because it's also flat. Don't question why I've got, well, I actually have three back scratchers on my desk. Um, and they form these angles of 120 degrees. So we're talking about two, two bonds is linear, three bonds is trigonal planar. That's with zero lone groups, lone pairs. If we have four, right again, count these number of bonds, right? We have four bonds and no lone pairs on our central atom, which is carbon. This would not be square planar. Again, we're working with three-dimensional geometries now. And so what you actually end up is this, and it's called, this is called a tetrahedral. So the bond angle between each of these things <clears throat> is 109.5 degrees. Um, so it's a geometric shape with four triangular faces or four points. Tetra means four. Now, this is where things get a little bit more complicated. Now we have three bonds, but we also have one lone pair. <clears throat> so there's a couple ways to think about this. So the electron geometry is tetrahedral, right? If we have four groups, that forms that, from this previous slide, the tetrahedron, but one of those is a lone pair now. And so instead of having a tetrahedral where we have four points, we only have three points. So we call this one trigonal pyramidal. So you end up with this geometry, right? Because there's this lone pair that pushes each of these hydrogen atoms, or hydrogen atoms on this molecule in particular. It's pushing them away from it. Um, and that gives us the trigonal pyramidal molecular geometry, right? So write down the difference between those. The electron geometry <clears throat> is just the arrangement of the electron groups. The molecular geometry is the arrangement of the atoms. And that's the key difference between um, when we start adding lone pairs as well as bonds. So um, if we predict the shape of water now. We have four electron groups, right? So four electron groups at its base is a tetrahedral. But the molecular geometry is bent. So you end up with, and we can write this one in two dimensions, right? We end up with lone pair and a lone pair. We'll talk about how to draw things in three dimensions later. But these lone pairs exert their influence on the bonding pairs. And we essentially get a tetrahedral, right? This is a tetrahedral, but two of these are lone pairs. And so that leaves just two arms, two points of this tetrahedral, and that's the bent geometry. And here's the useful table, right? You can look at your number of electron groups, your number of bonding groups, your number of lone pairs. This is the page or thing you want to screenshot for the test. Um, because you can go through and look through these, and you just need to remember if you're looking for the electron geometry or if you're looking for the molecular geometry, because those are different. <clears throat> right, and so we looked at these um, two electron groups, two bonding groups, linear, right, with zero lone pairs. If you look at trigonal planar, that's three electron groups, three bonding groups, zero lone pairs, trigonal planar. And you'll see too that when we don't have any lone pairs, the electron geometry is the same as the molecular geometry. Okay, so when we're predicting geometry using Vesper theory, we draw a correct Lewis structure for the molecule. Then we determine the total number of electrons, electron groups around the central atom. 
then you determine the number of bonding groups and the number of lone pairs. You go back to table 10.1 that we were just looking at, and you determine the electron and molecular geometries uh, by considering how the electron groups can get as far away from each other as possible. <clears throat> so let's look at this. This is chlorine, by the way. Not, uh, this isn't C-I-N-O. So nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine. Conveniently given that nitrogen is a central atom, yeah, we got one of each. So chlorine, nitrogen, oxygen, no charges. Chlorine is seven electrons, nitrogen is five electrons, and this is six, <clears throat> six electrons. Um, so again, we're going to end up with 18 electrons. And we start with our outer outer atoms first, or we start with our bonds first, excuse me. I'm just going to go ahead and draw these as bonds. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Looks pretty familiar, right? <clears throat> um, so we need to draw one of these. We need to take one of these and add it to make a double bond, right? So let's just take the oxygen, or we'll erase the oxygen. Take this and form a double bond. So we're going to get C or N, sorry, double bond O, right, and then chlorine. And you'll notice too that, right, we could draw a resonance structure. You should notice that we can draw a resonance structure, right, if we take those electrons from chlorine instead. But that's not going to change the number of bonding groups, and it's not going to change the number of electron groups. So first, our number of just electron groups, one, two, three. So there's three total electron groups. And we have one, two bonding groups. Let's do it up here. Two bonds and, right, there's this one lone pair. So one lone pair. Hopefully this will work. Nice. Hopefully you can read that. So we've got two bonds. We have, well, first, right, we have three total electron groups. So we can search down this table and just go to the ones with electron groups. And we have two bonding groups and one can lone pair. Can you point out the electron groups again real quick? Is that just each, each one of those molecules has electrons? Is that what that means? Or... Oh, we're only looking at the central atom. Okay, so the an electron group being one of those single bonds, the double bond, and then the lone pair, that's three? Yes. Okay, thanks. So each bond, yeah, regardless if it's a double or triple or single bond, that's one electron group, right? That's one group made up of electrons, and okay. lone pairs count as an electron group. And then we further divide that into our bonding and lone pairs. Okay. Yeah. So then because we have two... Uh, two bonding groups and a single lone pair, we end up with a trigonal planar geometry. Sorry, a trigonal planar... Um, wow. Uh, molecular geometry, or electron geometry. And we get a bent molecular geometry, right? Because we have a trigonal planar in terms of all three of our electron groups. So they'll be spread out by 120 degrees. But we're missing one of these atoms instead of uh, we have an electron pair, a lone pair, instead of an atom. So that's a bent molecular geometry. All right. So let's do the molecular geometry then for SO3, 2 minus. Right, we have an ion. 
So S, again, we have more oxygens than we do sulfur, so those are going to be our terminal atoms. And we'll have S, O, and I'm not going to remember, forget to do this, 6 times 3. And this is just 6 electrons. And then we also have a charge, and that's going to be 2 electrons. So if we do, right, 6 times 3 is 18, plus 6 is 24. 26 electrons. Start with our bonds. And then our lone pairs. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, right down here, 19, 20, 20, 21, 22, 23. Oh, I miscounted there. Should be 24, 25, 26. Um, and we can see, right, everything here has an octet. Sulfur's got three bonds. Those are each two electrons. So it's going to be six plus its lone pair. And then each of the oxygens has three lone pairs and a bond. So then to determine then our Vesper theory uh, geometries, we're just looking at the central atom, sulfur. Um, and then we can count the number of, so let's do our... I'm going to abbreviate electron because it's a long word. Our electron groups is going to be four. Our bonds or bonding groups, right, is going to be three. And I'm going to use LP for lone pair is going to be one. So we can look at our table then and we see, okay, we've got four electron groups. So we go down to four. And we have three bonds, so four electron groups, three bonding groups, one lone pair. Our electron geometry is going to be tetrahedral. But our molecular geometry is going to be trigonal pyramidal. So when we draw these chemicals out on paper, uh, we do need a way to represent them as 3D objects. So our straight line is that of a bond in the plane of the paper. Oh, the camera's still off. <clears throat> our hashed line is a bond projecting into the paper away from us. And the wedged line is a bond projecting out of the paper towards us. So you see linear, trigonal planar, and bent can all be drawn in two dimensions in the plane of the paper. But the tetrahedral, we have um, in yellow, let's color code these, yellow, red, blue, right? So we have these two yellow bonds that are in the plane of the paper. This hashed bond that's moving away from us or pointed away from us, and this one comes out towards us out of the paper. And then for a trigonal pyramidal, again, we've got three dimensions here. So that's coming out of the paper. It's going into the paper. And this is in line with the paper. And those can be definitely at first hard to visualize what those look like on the paper. Or, or to translate that from a paper to a sort of molecule in your mind can be difficult, especially at first. So I'm going to switch gears up a little bit here. That All that stuff that we just learned about Vesper theory and these molecular geometries is going to be important when we're talking about this. Uh, electronegativity and polarity, right? So this is why oil and water don't mix. Um, there's something about the water molecules that causes them to bunch together in one region and expels that causes them to expel the oil molecules into a separate region. The oxygen and hydrogen atoms each donate one electron to the covalent bond between them, 
because they don't share them equally. So the oxygen atom takes more than its fair share of this electron pair. So the electrons, you know, if we were to sort of draw it out, the electrons, instead of being right in the middle between them or being shared evenly, are going to be closer to the oxygen because it's greedy. And it's greedy because it's more electronegative. So electronegativity uh, determines or is a measure of an atom's affinity for electrons. So oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. So it sucks those electrons towards it um, and pulls them in more tightly than the hydrogen atoms do. Um, electronegativity is, we use it as a re, re, uh, relative scale, and fluorine is the most electronegative element, and it's an as assigned an electronegativity of four. Um, and again, we've got some periodic trends that we'll go over. Due to this unequal sharing, though, the oxygen atom has a partial negative charge, which we use this delta, delta negative, to show that there's a partial negative charge, and the hydrogen atom has a partial positive charge which is that delta positive. Come on. There you go. Delta positive. The result of this uneven sharing is a dipole moment, or a separation of charge between the bond, or within the bond. Right? Kind of like magnets. If you are to take a lot of these OHs, they'd stack up this way, right? And then we'd get hydrogens here. Draw these bonds so you know which ones are which. And so they all line up, right? The positives go to the negatives, the negatives go to the positives um, because of these dipole moments. Um, when we have covalent bonds that have a dipole moment, they're called polar covalent bonds. And the greater the electronegativity difference between the two elements, the greater the dipole moment and the more polar the bond. So uh, well, we'll see this on the next page here because we've got this table where we see fluorine up here, very high up, has an electronegativity of four, right? We said that it's the most electronegative, so it's the highest. Hydrogen has an electronegative of two. You see oxygen is 3.5. So when we're comparing oxygen to hydrogen, it's 3.5 to 2.1. So those electrons go to the more electronegative atom. If you have two elements in a covalent bond that have the same electronegativity, the electrons are shared equally, and there's no dipole moment. So if we have chlorine and chlorine, right, they're going to have exactly the same neg electronegativity. Those electrons are shared equally, right? So to represent them with dots, they'd be in the middle. If there's a large electronegativity difference, if it's big enough, right, then the difference between the two elements in a bond, um, then the electron is completely transferred, and that's an ionic bond. So we have... You know, if we have a, a difference of electronegativity is really high, then we have ionic. If the electronegativity difference is moderate, then it's polar covalent. And if it's a very small or low or, almost, or no difference, then we get a, a nonpolar covalent bond. Right, so ionic bonds are common between a metal and a nonmetal. So if we go back over here and you look, right, it's like sodium, potassium, strontium, all of these have very, very low electronegativities, so you get a very large difference between something like well, especially between like potassium and fluorine. Potassium fluoride, it's a massive difference. So you're going to get a complete transfer of that electron to fluorine. All right, so this is where, yeah, if there's an intermediate difference in electronegativity, right, a medium between the two elements, then we have polar covalent. Polar covalent bonds are common between two nonmetals. Right, so hydrogen and fluorine, sort of flip back here real quick, right? Fluorine is 4.0 and hydrogen is 
the difference there being 1.9. That's a moderate difference, whereas the difference between fluorine at 4.0 and potassium at 0 0.8 is 3.2. Right, so we're getting close to double the electronegativity difference. Um, these electronegativities, it's a continuous or, well, electronegativity is a continuous function, right? So there's, you can have anywhere between zero and four. Um, so we just kind of use these as an, a guide. It's a guideline for these approximate um, bond types. But this is the table to reference. You know, if I ask a question that's, you know, is the bond between hydrogen and fluorine, you know, what is the bond type between hydrogen and fluorine? Like, come back to this table and see that 0 0.4 to 2, in terms of difference, that's polar covalent. 0 to 0.4 would be pure covalent. Like when we have two of the same element bonded together, the difference in electronegativity there is 0. And then large differences, right, are 2 and up. So, oh, that's right. I wanted a table of this too. Okay, so we have iodine and iodine. All right, if we have two of the same, uh, it doesn't matter what their electronegativity is. Uh, the difference is zero. So this is a nonpolar covalent. Now if we look at cesium and bromine, let's flip back here. Cesium, 0 0.7. Fluorine is 4, or sorry, bromine. Bromine is 2.8. So we take our 0 0.7. 0 0.7 for cesium and 2.8 for bromine. So there's going to be a difference of 1.1, sorry, 2.1. So we go back to our table. Larger than 2 is going to be ionic, right? And you might have guessed that because cesium's a metal, bromine's a nonmetal. Phosphorus and oxygen. Flip back again real quick. What we should do is like this. <clears throat> so phosphorus and oxygen. Oxygen is 3.5. Phosphorus is 2.1. So 3.5, 2.1. So the difference there is going to be 1.4. And so because that difference is 1.4, that's between 0 0.4 and 2. That is a polar covalent. All right, and to uh, do you want to point out, right, this is another periodic trend. As we move right across the periodic table, electronegativity increases. And as we move from the bottom to the top of the periodic table, electronegativity is also increasing. So if we have polar bonds, that does not always mean that the entire molecule is polar, polar. A polar molecule has a net dipole moment over the entire molecule. The polar bonds add together instead of canceling each other out. So if we have something like carbon dioxide, we have, excuse me, Carbon and oxygen. I should bookmark this. So carbon is 2.5, oxygen is 3.5. So right, we're going to have an electronegativity difference of one. If we go back to our table, we'll see that uh, between 0 0.4 and 2 is polar covalent. So these are polar covalent bonds, right? So we can say that because oxygen is more negative, we can say that this has a partial negative, and a partial negative, and then there's a partial positive in the middle. But if you notice, <clears throat> this partial negative is exactly on the opposite side of this partial negative, with carbon dioxide being a linear molecule. And so they cancel each other out. So carbon dioxide is nonpolar.
because we have a negative pulling this, or a negative going this way, and a negative going this way of identical magnitude. So the difference between them is going to be zero. Oh, if you fall right on the line. Sorry, a couple messages here. Yes, we can take another break because it's been about an hour. Um, let's finish this up real quick. If you fall right on the line 2.0 or, or 0 0.4, mostly what we're going to talk about is um, okay, well, lithium. Okay, so if lithium chloride, good example, lithium chloride falls on the line. I'm assuming as a 2.0. It's a metal and a non-metal. Right, so we have other, other, other metrics that we can kind of pull out of our hat to look at these and identify what they're going to be. So that would be an ionic bond, right? Because we have a, a metal and a non-metal. What this uh, measure of electronegativity does for us is it gives us a, a theory or a reason behind why those bonds are ionic. Um, even though some of them do fall right on the line. Can you... Um... Just trying to see if we can get anything else that'll fall right on the line, like fluorine and arsenic. All right, so if you took fluorine and arsenic, you'd get an electronegativity difference of two. Um, arsenic is a metalloid. Uh, I'm going to avoid those types of questions because arsenic fluoride, that's a difference of 2.0. Anyways, let's, um, let's take a quick break then, come back in five minutes, and we can finish this out.
give it another minute or so. I did look up arsenic fluoride. It forms arsenic pentafluoride. Um, the one research article that I found says it lies between ionic and covalent. All right, so it is a borderline element. Um, right, so that would not be a good test question. The only way that might be a decent test question is like, Probably to be avoided. Right, because chem chemistry, <clears throat> chemistry as we learn it in 3A, Intro to General Chemistry, um, we don't cover all of the nuance um, because it just makes things way too complicated. Um, and it's not relevant to the class. Um, the idea is to learn these general um, general rules and general theories um, and the overarching uh, general concepts, right? It's, you want to get, uh, get in touch with each of the concepts. You want to do some math, you know, figure out how to count atoms, how to count molecules, what are moles, um, how to use those. You know, we talk about ionic and polar bonds, right? Because that determines a lot of how these polar molecules uh, interact and why polar and nonpolar molecules don't interact. <clears throat> Okay, I think it's been about five minutes. We're almost done. Um, right, so yeah, if you do get these ones on the border, they are exactly that on the border. Uh, if there's no other way to determine it, right? Because lithium chloride is a metal and a non-metal, clearly. But something like arsenic fluoride is a metalloid and a non-metal. Um, and so it's kind of an outlier compound in that regard. And so you would say it's got some, you would say it's on the border. Okay, moving on though. Carbon dioxide, so this is the example that I showed you, right? Has uh, two polar bonds. The uh, difference, so that delta means difference in electronegativity is one, uh, which makes it a polar covalent bond. So CO2 has this linear geometry, right? And one dipole moment both of the dipole moments are on these opposite ends. And because of that, right, this, oh, this is another way that we write dipole moments. This is the positive side. I use an arrow to point to the negative side. Um, but because these are directly opposed, it's nonpolar. And we'll see examples where that's not the case. So we can represent our polar bonds with arrows like uh, we showed in that previous one, right? So if we had something like HF, this would be positive that way and then negative this way. And if we draw these arrows and they point in exactly opposing directions, leaf blower, sorry. If they point in exactly opposing directions, the dipole moments cancel. So again, um, well, we'll do an example here. Water is an example of this, uh, where the dipole moments do not cancel because we have a bent molecule, right? Again, 1.4, that's polar covalent. Because water has a bent shape, our two dipole moments are sort of pointing, I don't know if you remember vectors for math, the vector for this would be in this direction. So we have a dipole moment and the molecule is polar, right? Because they're not canceling each other out. So this side would be positive. This side would be negative. Because this, this represents the positive side, and this is the negative side. <clears throat> so these are some of our common cases for adding dipole moments to determine whether a molecule is polar and uh, this is probably a good slide or if you find the uh, area in the textbook that has this figure something good to reference back to right so nonpolar identical polar bonds in opposite directions this one is a little bit harder to see but 
these are all pointing out away from the center and they're equally spaced so they cancel. This would be an example of a polar, um, like a trigonal planar, right? Because these are all pointing vaguely downwards and so the opposite ends would be pointing up so they don't cancel. Uh, same with bent here, right? This is a bent shape. Tetrahedral, again, is kind of the same concept as non-pol or as the uh, trigonal planar, in that these are all pointing in a different direction, and none of them directly opposes the other. But because they're evenly spaced, pointing out from the center, they all are canceling each other out. And this is only for identical bonds. So if one, of the, one or more of the bonds is different than the others, they don't cancel out and the molecule will be polar. They have to be identical polarity bonds. Uh, pointing on this side? Oh, so, right, because if we were to draw this, it was just, oh gosh. Let me zoom in on nonpolar here. Um, if we were to draw this, right, so we've got a central atom here. Since this is a linear, right, this would be carbon, oxygen, oxygen, right? We know that this is a polar covalent bond. It has a difference of, well, let me switch pens here to something. Difference in electronegativity of one. So the positive and negative charges, that's coming from our polar covalent bond. Um, the pointing, I'll do that first. It says plus and negative, plus negative. They're pointing in opposite directions, so that's what this is. So this is a slightly polar bond. If we just look at carbon bonded with oxygen, Car or oxygen has an electronegativity of, well, I think it was 3.5. And carbon has an electronegativity of 2.5. So the more electronegativity, more electronegative something is, the more it's going to attract electrons. So because the oxygen is more electronegative, you can kind of picture the electron cloud. You exaggerate this. Oh gosh. I'm trying to exaggerate this more. That the electrons are occurring more or are more over around the oxygen than they are the carbon. Okay. They're more around the car oxygen than the carbon and that's what creates that charge, partial charge. <clears throat> so that's what we're working with on all of these. <clears throat> so let's determine whether the molecule contain or so to determine whether the molecule contains polar bonds. The two bonding atoms have to be different, or have to have different electronegativities. And then you have to determine whether the polar bonds add together to form a net dipole moment. Right, so that's what we we're talking about here, where these would add together, add together to form a net dipole. That's a hard to see marker, but they form add together to form a uh, net dipole moment. So we use Vesper theory to determine the molecular geometry. Molecular geometry, not the electric geometry. Electric, or, uh, electron geometry. And then uh, we check if the molecule is symmetrical. So let's look at the Lewis structure. We want to look at, um, sorry, this is my mom's alternate version for determining molecular polarity. You look at the Lewis structure for the molecule. If it is non, um, it is nonpolar, if both these things are true, there are no lone pairs on the central atom, and the atoms bonded to the central atom are all the same, or have the same electronegativities. Okay, because if we have, um, let me bring up this bond angles chart again, right? So we're talking about no lone pairs. So if we look at anything with no lone pairs, we see we get bent, we get trigonal planar, and we get tetrahedral. And as we saw on this previous slide, uh, linear, 
Sorry, did I say bent? I meant to say linear. <clears throat> Not bent. We have linear. Um, trigonal planar. And we have tetrahedral. So as long as all of those bonding groups are the same or have the same electronegativity difference, they're nonpolar. And you can do that just from the Lewis structure. Because the Lewis structure tells you everything you need to know about lone pairs and bonding groups. Okay, so CH4. Right, so we do carbon, hydrogen, 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 right? Because hydrogen is almost always, um, well, in this class, hydrogen is always terminal. So H, one electron times four. Carbon equals four electrons times one. So we have eight electrons, and we see if we just throw those in here, and I'll just do them as bonds, two, three, four. So we have four there, right? And we've got all the proper number of valence electrons for everyone. We have, um, we then have four bonding groups. And we have zero lone pairs. And each of our groups is the same, right? They're all hydrogen. <clears throat> so according to this previous, Mrs. K's alternate method, we have no lone pairs on the central atom, and the atoms bonded to the central atom are all the same. So this is nonpolar. And if we take it one step further and we want to say, um, draw this out, you know, 3D. We have a tetrahedral, right? Because we have four bonding groups, zero lone pairs. We have a tetrahedral, and since all the groups are the same in that tetrahedral, um, it's nonpolar. NH3. There's N, H, H, H. <clears throat> So nitrogen has five, hydrogen, I'm just going to skip some steps here, right, since we're far enough along, we've done this enough times. We have three electrons for each of the hydrogens, right, this is the totals. So I have eight total electrons. Go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So now, according to Mrs. K's rules, we have a lone pair, right, the first check is no lone pairs. Well, we have a lone pair on our central atom. <clears throat> and really, by, you know, by route of deduction, right, if it's not nonpolar, then it must be polar. But let's look at this a little further, right? So we have one uh, lone pair. We have three bonds. If we bring up our bond or table here for geometries, we have uh, three, four electron groups, but we have three bonding groups, and we have one lone pair. So that means we have <clears throat> trigonal pyramidal, right? And we're going to specifically get a trigonal pyramidal um, with a lone pair on top. Right, so these are all going to be pointing in this direction. It's technically pointing a little more up than that. Right, so again, you, by, by uh, trigonal pyramidal, because we have three bonded groups. Um, according to Mrs. K's rules, right, it's not nonpolar because we have a lone pair. So this is a polar. freaked out on me. Come on. Okay. 
Move it along. Just a few more things at the end here. So let's do SO2 now. All right, again, more oxygens. So those are going to be... Those are going to be our terminal groups. So we're going to get 18 electrons. We'll do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Yep, we've seen this one before. Um, so we're actually going to end up with, you know, again, some resonant structure. It's one of those things you should just, if you can always be looking for the resonance structure, and that way, if you come across a question that requires that you know there's a resonance structure, or asked if there's a resonance structure, you'll already be there. But, we can then take a look at this one, and again, right, we're looking at our central atom here. Uh, let's, we've been doing lone pairs first, so one lone pair, and two bonds, two bonding groups, right? Doesn't matter if it's a double or a triple or a single. <clears throat> and we have three electron groups, but we have two bonding groups and one lone pair. So we have a bent geometry. And again, remember, you know, Mrs. K's alternate rules. The first rule is that there are no lone pairs. So simply by the fact that we have a lone pair, and these are the same, we have another polar compound. <clears throat> right, and it's similar to water, right? Because water would also have a bent. And in that case, we've got two lone pairs. So, why don't oil and water mix? Well, it's because water molecules are polar and oil molecules are nonpolar. The polar molecules interact strongly with other polar molecules because just like magnets, all right, we have this slight positive and then there's a slight negative here and those opposite charges attract. And so they stick together very, well, in the case of water, very strongly. And the interactions between polar and nonpolar molecules are much weaker. So a mixture of polar and nonpolar molecules is similar to a mixture of magnetic and non-magnetic marbles. The magnetic marbles are going to clump together, and because they're really attracted to each other and they stick and they want to get in close, they squeeze all of those other molecules out. And so they all get pushed to a different region, and that's why they separate. They get squeezed out. It's just some everyday chemistry here. So why does why does um, soap work, right? So grease, oil, those are all fats. Those are all nonpolar. Um, but when you add soap, the grease washes away, dissolves in the water. So what's happening actually is that one end of soap molecule is polar and can interact strongly with the polar water molecules, and the other end is nonpolar and interacts strongly with the nonpolar grease and oil. And so you essentially get... Right, this would be a soap molecule. It's like a, a tow truck uh, for these nonpolar molecules. Selenium fluoride. Sure, yeah, we'll do selenium fluoride. So then when you get something like this, you get all of your waters, all of your waters on this end. And when you run the sink, you run the faucet, or you start mixing them up, this nonpolar tail sticks to all of your really long nonpolar greases and pulls them along with it. Okay, as requested, let's do a Lewis structure selenium SEF4. Okay, so we have selenium with six. Or no, selenium. 
Yeah, selenium was six. All right, selenium, fluorine. Fluorines each have seven, All right, times four. So you're gonna get 28 um, plus six, so 34 electrons. So just like hearing me count. All right, so we're going to do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. Oh, we have two extra electrons, 33, 34. Um, so this is a situation, right, where you have selenium now with extra electrons more than an octet. Was this from the homework? From the homework. And it was just SEF4? Oh, your microphone isn't working? It says you're muted. This uh, probably falls under the category of one of the exceptions. Anyways, well, I guess, I guess we should do it for the sake of the, you know. I'm sure somebody else will ask about it. Um, let me open up the textbook. Which question number was this? Seven. Are you still able, unable to hear me? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, there we go. It wasn't working. I kept unmuting myself and it wasn't working. So, yeah, this is number 107 from the homework. And that's where I was, because it had EF5, SF4, and then SPF4. All of them had um, extra more than more than uh, eight, more than an octet. Oh, yeah. Well, it says each molecule contains an expanded octet. Uh, 10 or 12 electrons around the central atom. So does that mean we're just okay on certain cases that there's yeah. exceptions? Yeah, there are just special, there are special cases. And there's, there's a set of, um, there are more Vesper geometries, which I guess we don't cover in this class, that cover these expanded octet situations. Okay. I mean, so I'm just, I imagine other people are going to have the same question, so I figured we may as well touch on it. So Yeah, no, it's a good question. Is this going to be like a test question, or, or are you just going to be good? No. Well, there might be one. Um, like, I'll probably put something on with boron, right? Okay. Because you need to remember that boron can do just That's six. Good. So, um, yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, Thanks. it's something you need to remember. I, I think if I did this, it would be something like like this forms with an expanded octet, you know? So it would let you know that it's an expanded octet. And you would know that, they, you know, whatever it is has to be, um, it's going to have 10 or 12 electrons around the central atom. <clears throat> but if you do this, you know, if you follow the rules, it's, it's the only way to draw it, you know? At least for this one, it just kind of ends up that way. Cool. I will, um, again, record those lectures. Um, lecture for tomorrow and the lecture for Thursday will be recorded. I'm going to record them both tonight. Um, or definitely tomorrow's I will record tonight. And then hopefully I'll get to do um, Thursday's as well. And just, you know, while you're watching it, if you have a question about something, um, shoot me a text, message me on Discord, whatever. Um, I've got just other stuff that I need to handle during the day. All right. Thanks for showing up. Thanks for being here. Um, I wish I could do in-person or live lectures um, the rest of this week. Um, yeah. All right. Thanks for showing up and participating and I will um, I guess you'll see virtual me <laughs> more virtual recorded James uh, Professor Kawagoa in the next couple lectures thank you alright thanks guys